Hello there, welcome back to my workshop. This is part two of the 286 video. And at the end of the last episode, we got it to boast. Now it has a lot of problems and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So just like before, I've done a few things off camera. I, I couldn't avoid it. And the first part was regards to the keyboard input. Now in the first video, I mentioned that I was using the wrong instructions. So this is the pinout for the chip that I had at first. And as I said, it has test naught, test one, and then these four lines on the other side. But it didn't really explain how it was using them. It was a bit generic. And this was confusing me when I was looking at the circuit. So eventually I found this second one. And as we can see in the second one, this pinout actually makes a bit more sense. So it's not test anymore, it's TO and T1. And these are the clock and data signals coming in from the keyboard. We then have two lines that clearly say clock and data. And these are what's generated from the keyboard controller when it's sending signals out to the keyboard. And then in between the two, there is this circuit. And this circuit we can see goes through some 7-4 logic. And that is this IC up at the top. So with the aid of this new information, I was able to trace this circuit. So as we see, the signal comes in from the keyboard, goes to the inputs on the keyboard controller. The outputs of the keyboard controller go up to the 7.4 LS logic. And one of them goes through two gates, and then that goes out to the keyboard controller. But the bit that was confusing is that it actually goes back down and connects to the input. So both the input and the output join in one place. Now without this diagram, this was causing me all sorts of confusion and I wasn't sure what was going on. So now that I've explained how the keyboard circuit works, let's plug this in and actually get set up so that we can have a look at it working. Okay, we are set up, got the graphics card plugged in and the keyboard and we connected up to the ATX power supply from the Micro 8088 just like before. So if we switch it on, go through the memory test, we've got our battery is dead, drive A error, but you note that we no longer get the clock error. If we do F2, the keyboard is working, as we see, and we can go into setup. So just the basic setup, date, time, memory, type of floppy drives. We haven't got anything connected up. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And then we can do F10, escape, escape. So now it will boot and we will just get the floppy error. So that all looks very promising. What I wanted to do next was connect up my XT IDE it was the quickest way I could think to get something to actually work on the system. Okay, so this has got its own BIOS. We don't need to worry about doing anything with that. So we could just turn it on and, and ignore any of the errors. So we could just resume and the XT IDE has its own BIOS, like I say. So this will just boot and it will boot off the compact flash. Now if we go into check it, that all looks good. We can look at the current configuration, look at the CMOS table, and then we could run a basic memory test. And that's okay. We can look at the system board. All good. On the real time clock, when I first got this switched on, it was running slow and it was running slow enough that it was getting out by like half an hour every two hours. As it stands now, it's working okay because I basically rebuilt the clock circuit. One of the reasons why I rebuilt the clock circuit is because I removed the ISA connector 
to look underneath it for corroded stuff and I'll show you that later on but the clock is good and it is keeping the correct time you can run a benchmark and that looks normal 15.72 megahertz 286 so at this point I was pretty happy that it was booting and everything looked good of course the next thing that I did was run a game so let's run Wolf 3D and this appears to play okay I've tried a few other games as well Prince of Persia also ran okay so like I said I was quite happy I had the keyboard working now after those bodge wires and the system seems to be working okay with the XT to IDE my next step was to go on eBay and buy a basic IDE floppy serial controller this is a gold star one and I thought I would try to get a floppy disk work. I've got a floppy disk that was in the Micro 8088. So this should just be a matter of plugging this in. One of the reasons to run the floppy disk is to run ID info so that we can detect how the system is detecting the compact flash card on this IDE card. So I've disabled everything else so it doesn't conflict. And we should be able to just plug this in and connect up a floppy drive and away we go. Now there's one thing that I need to address. I'm having to put the settings in every single time that we turn it off. So we will look at that shortly, but for now, let's just test the floppy drive. Okay, we have a floppy drive connected up, so we can turn it on. So F2. For some reason, it always detects the floppy drive as a 1.2 megabyte. I'm not quite sure why it does that, but we'll set it to 1.44. Escape, escape. So we'll boot off the XT IDE and we'll put a disk in and we can just do DIR A colon and that appears to work we are reading the floppy disk I then try to boot off the disk and it did not work it will not boot off any disks whatsoever and I spent a long time trying to work this out like so much time and I've, I've checked things, which was a complete waste of time. But if I read the file off the floppy disk that is less than 512 bytes, it will read it. If we then read one that is more than 512 bytes, it tries to read it. And then the system just randomly locks up. So that's it. It won't do anything else now. It doesn't matter what it is and it just randomly crashes so if we boot off the disk we wait for it to get so far and then we press A to boot from the floppy disk inside the XT IDE BIOS so you can see that it's trying and this program get so far and then it uncompresses itself but it just does that it gets so far and then the machine crashes again so it won't boot from a disk and it won't read files larger than 512 bytes off a disk but it will run everything perfectly fine off the XT IDE so I asked Ronald Vogons and the general feeling was that this must be a DMA problem. Somebody else suggested that it's because the battery isn't working and on their machine, if it the battery wasn't working, it detected the floppy drive as a 1.2 and it was only when the battery was working that it fixed it. So I'm gonna take all this apart and then I'm gonna show you all, the, all of the work that I've done on the board so far. You may notice that there is a lack of ISA slot right just there. That was the area that was quite heavily corroded. So I wanted to remove that so that I could have a look at the traces that run underneath it 
because these, these are quite important up at the top. We do have a battery connected up, but if that jumper isn't in, it doesn't do anything. I'm not quite sure why that isn't working. This is the battery circuit here, and it's got these transistors and the diodes, which switch over from when the power is on and switch to battery. Now we get to the fun part. The two blue wires were a result of taking off the ISA slot. Same with this green wire at the top. Now that green wire was causing me so many problems because it was intermittent. Sometimes it would work and then other times it wouldn't work. So when that line is missing, which is data line six, graphics cards don't work. So I switched it on and over and over and tried every slot and tried jumpers. As you can see, I'm just turning it on and on and nothing was working. So eventually I got the scope out and I probed the data lines going across the ISA slots. And I found that it was on this first one that I removed, but it wasn't going any further. So that was data line six. So I put that one in. We then have the bodges for the keyboard. So the line that comes in goes to the input of the controller, same with this purple one. And then that one goes up to the uh, 74LS logic to do the inverting. And then that one comes back out again. These are the two wires for the oscillator fix. And then the wires that are running around the outside uh, were the original ones that were just going across. So I moved those out of the way. Then at the top, we've got more bodge wires to fix problems with that 74LS06. So that wasn't missing some stuff. And again, as a result of taking out the 8-bit ISA slot, I did more damage to that. So as we saw at the intro, the lines come in and they go up to there and one of them goes to these ones on the th that end. The other ones come into here. And then this one is for the real-time clock with this crystal. When I first got it, the crystal must have been wrong or that capacitor because it was running slow and it was running slow by about half an hour every two hours. But then after removing this, it was running crazy, crazy fast. You can see in this shot where the time is running and you can actually see it like counting up really, really quickly. Well, whatever I did when I was removing this, again, I did some damage in this area and it was one of the connections that go from this first one over to here. So I've put a new crystal in, I've put a new 27 picofarad capacitor, a new uh, 74HC14. Eventually found the bad trace, which was going from this uh, leg of that capacitor up to the input on there. So because that one was missing, the crystal was running at like 100 megahertz. Uh, so that was another like afternoon of checking everything and I eventually got it working. So now we, we do have a new chip and the clock is running perfectly. Tested it and it isn't losing any time whatsoever. Now the only downside to fixing that was because I thought maybe the system was running slow thanks to the clock, which was causing the floppy disk problems. But now that that's running perfectly, the floppy disk still isn't working. So the, the clock not working correctly is a red herring. As far as I can tell, everything on this is working correctly. And I've measured that when the power is off, we get like one volt coming out of here and it goes over to the real time clock. So we, we can measure on uh, pins 24, 22, 20 and 18. And they all measure one volt. And I can see over here when the power is turned off that it's taking voltage from the battery. When I turn it on, it switches over and we output 5 volt. Replace these transistors. I've checked all, like lifted the legs up and checked all of these components and they're all good. But if the battery has a charge, it just will not turn on. So I'm going to turn it on and that's all it does and it makes this like little blip noise. Sometimes it does that, so no postcodes at all. So again, I'm not quite sure what's going on, why when the battery is charged, it doesn't boot. I have a 3.6 volt battery. I've got a 4.8 volt battery. Doesn't matter, as soon as they've got some kind of charge, it doesn't boot.
So my two main problems, the battery circuit and reading floppy disks from DMA. Now we're going to get really fancy. And after talking to my, uh, my friend Chris and people on Vogons, we were interested in what was happening with the floppy drive and especially around the DMA. There is a protocol for DMA transfer and one of them pointed me to this table. And on this table you could see that it's instigated with the DR2 request and then it's acknowledged with the uh, DACK2 to say, yep, I'm happy to do that. And then it transfers data across and at the end of it, it gives uh, a, a TC to say that that's the end of this block. Now to look at this a bit closer, I decided to use my logic analyzer and to save a lot of messing about, I connected it up with this prototype ISE card. So you can see all of the connections are already set up for me. So all I need to do is plug it in an ISA slot and that's it. Simple as that. What, I, what I've got on here is just the lines set up and we could monitor things in real time. If we just do a looping. So you can see at the moment it's not doing anything. And then I'll turn the power on and all of a sudden lots of activity. And I'll stop that and then I'm going to change this to be a trigger. And it will trigger by the line that says I want to do DMA. So we'll do a good one and then we'll do a bad one. So if we do DIR A color slash 400.txt. So this is the file that I know works. So I'll start it running and it's waiting for the trigger. I start the floppy drive. It's now says that it's recording. So we'll capture some data. And now if we do the type to look at that actual file. We can do a new session. Start recording, type the file out, it's found the trigger. So we've now got the data from actually reading that file. So you can see that's where it started, it was triggered by the DRQ2. It ha it's the DMA acknowledged with the DACK. And if we scroll towards the end, keep a note, you see the mem right line, there's nothing on it. until it gets to a certain point, then it starts to write out data. Now I captured the same thing on my Pentium and that one was writing data all the time. It didn't wait until a certain point. And apparently this headland chipset has got something that, that buffers it until a certain point. So we think that that's correct. But now if we do one where the file doesn't work, So another session, we start it going, looking at the file that will crash it, it's triggered the recording, the computer's locked up, and if we scroll back, It never writes anything to memory. So there was nothing on the memory write line. And I don't know if this is because the computer crashes before it gets to execute and write the contents of the buffer. I don't know. All I know is I can make it crash on demand and I can see the instructions that it's doing the instructions seem to follow the table 
that I was given with the order that it does things but on this machine it just doesn't write if there's more than 512 bytes of data on the floppy disk. So I'm in the Sadie Logic program and I've got the two captures that we just did. So the 400 byte file that worked, the 500 byte file that doesn't work and one that I captured from the Pentium reading the same good file. And on here we have a complete like cycle ending with the TC. If we zoom in, we can go all the way in. So we have our DRQ2, which is the request to do DMA. We have the DAC2 that says the DMA is in progress. And then we have reads and DMA is enabled. That carries on, but you can see there's no data on mem write. So that goes on and it's basically like counting down until a block of data is complete. And then it issues a TC command to say that one block of DMA is finished. So that's the point that the DMA is finished. And then the computer does other things. And then there is another block of DMA and another and another. And now on this board, when it's got past so many blocks, it then starts to write data. So these aren't the actual blocks of data. This is just, this just says write data. So it will then do other things that you can't even see here, but you can see we've got IO is ready and we write data. So a big block of data. So that's the end of our data. So within that section there, it has transferred the DMA and displayed that text file on the screen. Now, if we go to our Pentium, although it's a slightly different layout because I did this a while ago, we have the same basic structure. So DRQ, DAC, DMA is enabled, but here we've got activity on the memory write all the time. So you can see that it's constantly writing data until it gets to the end of the DMA request and then it stops and the computer does its other stuff and another block of data. Now that is different to what we saw on our 286 when it was working but according to the documentation that somebody found that's actually how the Headland chipset works. So now let's look at the difference between the one that failed. So it looks normal we have our normal block of data so that's a DMA request another DMA request and another and another and another and it keeps going but then it never writes data there's no no memory write doesn't write anything. The only difference I can see there is that the IRQ doesn't go high like it does on the bad one. I didn't capture the IRQ for the Pentium. So I don't know if that is relevant, but it's the only thing that I can see that's different. And you can see that it's doing more DMA requests because it's a larger file, but it never writes anything. I want to test the IDE card with the floppy drive. So I've set up my Pentium. I've got the same floppy drive, got the same disc, same IDE controller, same XT to IDE. Everything is the same. So if you repeat our testing, so we do a, a directory of the A drive, and that is okay. We type our file, which is less than 512 bytes. And that displays okay. Type our file which is bigger than 512, 
Display's okay. This was the one on the disc that I originally tried to read, and that is okay. So I know that this card is working. I know that it works okay with the XT to IDE. I know that this floppy drive is okay. I know the floppy disk is okay. So that's as far as I've got. Not sure about the battery charging part and why it doesn't boot when the battery is fully charged. And not being able to read files from floppy disks that are more than 512 bytes in size. I, I just don't know, this is a little bit beyond what I can do. Doesn't help that the schematics that I've got don't match the version of this board as well. So my battery circuit isn't the same as the schematic that I've got. It kind of half is, and then other parts are different. I've checked tracers going everywhere. I spent two weeks looking at all the data and um, I even made a mistake where I'd got the wrong lead going to the wrong place and that sent me down a rabbit hole which I've just fixed today and it hasn't actually helped me in any way so that was a bit of a waste of time. So I'm kind of at a point where I just don't think that I personally can fix the floppy drive problems on this board. It could be something simple um, but I've just got to the point where I just don't want to look at it anymore. So I think I'm going to leave it here Perhaps you could pass me some information or leave a comment if you have any ideas. There is a thread on Vogons where you'll see everything that's going on. I'll leave a link in the description. And I'm just going to do something else as my next project. And then maybe we'll come back to this one with a fresh pair of eyes and we'll be able to fix it. So this one's definitely a fail. The computer said no. And I'm not happy about the situation. But that's just sometimes how it goes when you don't have good instructions, when the board schematics don't match the one that you've got. Sometimes it's just hard to find these faults. So I'll see you soon uh, with another project and then we'll come back to the 286 at a later date. Thank you for watching. See you again.